we have seen about the 12 links in the theory of the law of dependent origination. These 12 links explain how or what's the reason for a man to be sorrowful or how sorrow comes into existence and what are the ways or which way we'll be able to really understand and get over them. So this among the 12 links, the main aspect what we have seen is that of the ignorance. Now, after having dealt with the 12 links in the dependent origination or explaining what are the, or the interdependence of everything that is coming into existence, then we may ask, is there any person who is free from this interdependence? According to Buddhism, only arhats and bodhisattvas who are enlightened have liberated themselves from the fundamental errors that imprison them within the cycle of birth and death in samsara. So only these two groups have, that is the arhats, that is in the uh, Hinayana tradition, and Bodhisattva ideal in Mahayana, these people, they are the enlightened ones who have really understood what is the real nature or the, uh, the real quality of the nature and then they have freed themselves or enlightened beings. Ordinary beings, they die leaving with the, ignor leaving with the ignorance which carries them to next life that is rebirth, so on and so forth. Old age and death is a condition for ignorance, uh, for ignorance of self. Then the next learning or the important element is about the self. Among all Buddha's teachings, those on the nature of self are the hardest to understand. So the teaching of Buddha is anatman or anatha, non-self. Yet they are very central to the religion. It's very difficult to understand what is that non-self. According to him, nothing is permanent in this world, including the self. So that is the stand which Buddha, Buddhism takes. So everything, the whole nature, the phenomenal world is insubstantial and impermanent, including the self. So self is also is the combination of all the skandhas, that is which we are coming to. So there isn't anything which is totally independent and that which remains forever. So among all Buddha's teachings, those on the nature of self are the hardest to understand, yet they are very central to that religion. In fact, fully perceiving the nature of the self is one way to define the enlightenment. Now, what are the phenomenal world that is around us that we are con the consisting of? The Buddha taught that the individual is the combination of five aggregates or skandhas. For instance, also so-called the five skandhas or the five heaps and which are they? These are the five skandhas we have. Form, sensation, perception, mental formations and consciousness. So what is an individual? Individual is the aggregate of all these five skandhas uh, or the five heaps. Various schools of Buddhism interpret the skandhas in somewhat different ways. Generally, the first skandha is our physical form. The second made up of feelings, emotional and physical, and our senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, that is the sense perception. The third skandha is the perception takes in the most of what is known, what we can call the thinking, the conceptualization, cognition, reasoning. This comes into the third aspect. 
This also includes the recognition of what occurs when an organ comes into contact with an object. Perception can be thought of that which identifies the object perceived may be a physical object or a mental one such as an idea. So what an individual consists of these five skandhas at the aggregate of all this together. The fourth skandha, mental formations, includes habits, prejudices and pure disp uh, dispositions. Our volition or willfulness also part of the fourth skandha as our attention, faith, consciousness, pride, desire, vindictiveness and many other mental states both various and both virtuous and not virtuous. The cause and effects of karma are especially important to the fourth skandha. So the theory of karma that is very well integrated into Buddhist system and which comes in the fourth aspect, the fourth skandha. The fifth skandha is the consciousness, is awareness of or as sensitivity to an object but without conceptualization. Once there is awareness, the third skandha might recognize the object and assign a concept value to it. And the fourth skandha might react with uh, the fourth skandha may react with the desire of revol revulsion or some other mental formation. The fifth skandha is explained in some schools as the base that ties experience of life together. That is the uh, consciousness. What is consciousness? The experience of life together that is made. So according to Buddhism, an individual is the aggregate of these five aspects of the skandhas. Form, sensation, perception, mental formations and consciousness. So these 12 links and 5 skandhas, that's in a great way explains what it is. So in all that, Buddhism tells us that there isn't anything which is totally independent. Even the very uh, theory of the self or the non-self, that is also an impermanent thing according to Buddhism. So that is also a byproduct of all these 5 skandhas put together or a combination of that or the byproduct of the skandhas. So therefore, there is nothing that is continued in existence. So that is the uh, theory which it, the Buddhism holds. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is, there is uh, some substract from that which continues to be, it is not there. So all together what is interdependence as we have seen in the theory of dependent origination. How things come into existence or what is that causes your sorrow? It is the various causes, various conditions in life. Now we go to explain what is this self or the not self. What is most important to understand about the skandhas is that they are empty. So these five things this, which we say that an individual is made of these five skandhas or the aggregates of all this, then these are empty. I mean, so there isn't, uh, they are not the qualities that an individual possesses, but there is no self possessing them. So these are, they are not qualities of an, uh, an individual possesses because there is no self possessing them. So, we do not, cannot say that these are the qualities possessed by an individual because according to Buddhism there is no permanent self which is possessing them. This doctrine of no self is called Anatman or Anatha. Two, by two names it is known. Ana, Anatman and Anatha. On the surface of this uh, appears to be nihilistic teaching. But the Buddha taught that if we can see through the delusion of 
the small individual self, we experience that which is not subject to birth and death. So if we can see through the delusion or the deception of this permanent self, that's what most of the uh, religion or most of the theory which was taught, there is something which is uh, continues to be that's a self. But even Buddhism denies that very existence of something that is permanent. So for them everything is uh, chaniga momentary or without any uh, permanency. That is the very nature of the phenomenal world. Beyond this point, Theravada Buddhism, that is a Hinayana, and a Mahayana Buddhism differ on how Anatman is understood. In fact, more than anything else, it is the different understanding of self that defines and separates the two schools. So we have seen there is a two major schools in Buddhism or the two major divisions in Buddhism. One is the Theravada school of Buddhism that is called the uh, Hinayana school of Buddhism and Mahayana school of Buddhism. So Hinayana that is a little more stricter in its interpretation whereas Mahayana it is a bit liberal in its uh, or more flexible. So these two schools understand the theory of Anatman in a different way and that is the main difference between them. Very basically Theravada considers that is the Hinayana school of Buddhism considers Anatman to mean that an individual's ego or personality is a delusion. Once freed from this delusion, the individual may enjoy the bliss or nirvana. So Theravada school of Buddhism will say that that is this individual's ego or personality which we say that it is the ag aggregate of all these five skandhas and we take it for or mistake for a uh, personality of an individual and that is a delusion. So once freed from this delusion an individual may enjoy the bliss or nirvana. Mahayana on the other hand considers all physical form to be void of intrinsic self. So all physical form is void or emptiness uh, as, as a void of intrinsic self. There is no self abiding in an individual. A teaching called shunyata which means emptiness that is very much belonging to Mahayana tradition. That is Shunyavada, emptiness. The ideal of Mahayana is to enable all beings to be enlightened together, not only out of sense of compassion, but because we are not really separate autonomous being. So according to the, uh, the under understanding of Mahayana Buddhism, it is not that that uh, what is uh, strive or striving after is not individual salvation. So there is nothing called a self that is abiding in a person. Nothing is permanent. And therefore we all together need to strive for that liberation or the reality about that. That is uh, enlightened. The ideal is to get enlightened about. So what the Mahayana calls is that of the Shunyavada, that is emptiness, the void. What is this Shunyavada or how do we understand that? According to the Mahayana teaching of Shunyada, beings and things have no intrinsic existence in themselves. So all is but the interdependence or as we have seen the twelve links which follows one or the other. So one is the cause and at the same time it becomes the effect too. So all phenomena come into being because of conditions created by the other phenomena. Thus they have no existence of their own and are empty of a permanent self. 
there is neither reality nor not reality but only relativity according to the uh, buddhist the mahayana school of teaching what is that is only relativity and not that reality or non reality but relativity that interdependentness that is the one there is no permanent self thus we have no existence of their own or are empty of a permanent self so if only there is a permanent self then we can speak of that this self being at one with all these qualities and therefore the individual is possessing that and that is individuality but here that is also denied altogether there is nothing of that then this emptiness is not nihilistic so buddha or the mahayana school of buddhism does not speak about the nihilism all phenomena are void of self essence but it is incorrect to say that phenomena exist or don't do not exist form and appearance create the world of myriad of things form and appearance they create a myriad of things but the myriad of things have an identity only in relation to each other beyond identity shunyata is the absolute reality that is all things and beings unmanifested and what is shunyata shunyata is beyond the form and appearance so for beyond the form and appearance so what we see around the phenomenal world number of things the form and the appearance they create a world of things different things put together but once we can get through this form and appearance then beyond that one is the identity of shunyata that is the unmanifested uh, self or we can say or beyond the shunyata shunyata is the absolute reality that is all things of beings unmanifested so the reality is that which is not manifested what is manifested is only the aggregate or the combination of various aspects or the skandhas and the form and appearance so what we see beyond that what the mahayana buddhism calls is the shunyata now from here we go to another term that is explained as the nirvana these are some of the major terms which we come across one is that shunyavada that is of the uh, mahayana school of buddhism and then the nirvana what is nirvana sanskrit also nirvana that in pali nibbana is the earliest and most common term used to describe the goal of buddhism buddhist path the term is ambiguous and has several meanings the literal meaning is blowing out or a quenching within the buddhist tradition the term has been commonly been interpreted as the extinction of three fires so what what is this extinction or extinguishing of these uh, fires three poisons which is called the passion aversion and ignorance these are the three poisons in human being passion is raga aversion is dvesha and ignorance is avidya or moha or avidya when these fires are extinguished release from the cycle of birth that samsara is attained so what holds you to or pinned to the earth is these three passions or three poisons raga dvesha and moha or avidya ignorance so when are you said to be released the moment you can extinguish these three passion these three fires then nirvana is attained or you are no more under the circle of birth deaths and births that is a samsara in time with the development of buddhist doctrine other interpretations were given such as the absence of the weaving vana of activity of the mind the elimination of desire and escape from the woods 
and the five skandhas or aggregates. So later on different interpretations were given with regard to what is this nirvana. And then one of the explanation is that the interpretation was that such as the absence of weaving that is by the mind, the activity of the mind and elimination of desire. So as we have seen in the Four Noble Truths and the uh, Ashtanga Marga, the way to liberation is to stop all the desires. So when you put a full stop to all the desires, then automatically you gain yourself or you are rising to that of that free from all the wants. And that seems to be the liberation or the Nirvana. No more of the accumulation of karmic principles in your life and then you are set to liberate yourself. Buddhist tradition distinguishes between Nirvana in this lifetime and Nirvana after death. In Nirvana in this lifetime, physical life continues. But with the state of mind that is free from negative mental states, peaceful, happy and non-reactive. With the Nirvana after life, after death, that is para, 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 para Nirvana, that is the last remains of the physical life vanishes and no further rebirth takes place. So there is a Nirvana in life, the physical life continues and in there is a Nirvana after the death, that is Para Nirvana, the life the last remains of the physical life vanishes and no further rebirth takes place. Nirvana is the highest aim in the Theravada Buddhism or the Hinayana school of Buddhism. In Mahayana tradition, the highest goal is Buddhahood or to be enlightened in which there is no abiding in Nirvana but Buddha re-enters to the world and work for the salvation of all sentient beings. That is the Bodhisattva ideal. The Bodhisattva ideal is that of the Mahayana Buddhism, whereas the Hinayana Buddhism, the ideal is that is individual liberation or that is the uh, Arhaduhut. So once you reach that, that is the final goal for the uh, Hinayana Buddhism. From here we go to understand the theory of karma. There's a lot of misunderstanding with the word karma. So these are some of the key uh, points in which it comes in Buddhism, which we need to really pay attention to so that we get a real understanding of what it is. Karma is a word everyone knows. So if you ask anyone, the normal understanding of karma is understood as uh, fatalism. That's my fate, this is my karma. I'd, I have failed my exam, that's my karma. I lost my job, it's my karma. It's a kind of uh, lining along with the aspect of uh, fatalism. But actually that is not the understanding of uh, karma in the Buddhism. So karma is a word that is everyone knows, yet few Westerners understand the, what it means. Westerners to think, often think that it means a fate or some kind of uh, uh, cosmic justice system. This is not a Buddhist understanding of karma, however. Karma in Sanskrit means action. Sometimes you might see the Pali spelling kama, which means the same thing. In Buddhism, Karma has more specific meaning, which is volitional and willful action. So karma is a justice system. Things we choose to do or say or think set karma into motion. So it's a pure volition. That is, the things we choose to do, say or think, they set the karma into motion. The law of karma is the law of cause and effect. Sometimes Westerners use the word karma to mean the result of karma. For example, someone might say, John lost his job because 
that is his karma however as buddhist use the word karma is the action not the result the effects of karma are spoken as the fruits of the result of karma so that is that means every action produces its a result so this could be good result or bad result depending on the type of the karma and accordingly that is the result or the justice is being done now the liberation liberating prote- protect potential of karma that's what we are going to see into the liberating potential of the karma